a parking lot full of American Detroit iron, the automobiles that brought Americans from all over this great nation and visitors worldwide to what Walt Disney would coin as the happiest place on earth. As a young boy watching his television shows, I believe it probably was the happiest place on earth, and for a time, at least while he was still alive, I think it really was. While not the oldest theme park in America, that honor goes to Lake Compounds, uh, I think I said that right, in Bristol, Connecticut. This park opened over 100 years before Disneyland and has been in continuous operation ever since. But Disneyland and those Disney parks that followed hold the distinction for being the most popular and, in my opinion, probably the most unique. Walt's Disneyland opened for the first time in Anaheim, California on July 17, 1955. What was once 160 acres covered with orange groves has become without doubt the most recognized name in family entertainment worldwide. Disneyland breaking all records attracted more than 18 million visitors in both 2018 and 19, and park visitors for those two years alone dropped just under $3 billion in Mickey Mouse's giant pockets. On opening day in 1955, park admission was just $1, but riders had to pay extra for the tickets to the main attractions. Today, in 2022, $235 will get you a single-day pass. But hey, you get to ride everything for that one low price. Gee whiz, what a deal. The scenes in this video are comprised of films from several different sources that I've owned over the years and contain footage of the park itself and some interesting behind-the-scenes footage from 1956 as well as Walt Disney himself and a gentleman named Joe Fowler. Many of you watching this video are scratching your heads right now thinking, Joe who? Actually, this video is primarily about Joe Fowler, but I'll tell you a lot more about him in just a bit. But you might just say that without Admiral Joe Fowler, Disneyland would probably not be what it is today. Oh yes, yeah, speaking of Walt, here he is in a rare short clip conducting a small orchestra someplace near Tomorrowland. There have been many changes at this park over these many years, with old attractions being torn down and new ones taking their place. Sometimes small changes were made, like the little settler's cabin burning in the woods. I have two different clips here. One is from 1960 and the other from 1964. And you can see that the dead settler with the Indian arrow sticking out of him has been repositioned. The cabin underwent many changes over the years as the story surrounding it became more politically correct until finally in 2017 the original burning cabin was removed to make room for the Star Wars attraction. Both the north end of Tom Sawyer Island and the cabin are no longer there. The Rivers of America loop was shortened and a new non-burning cabin was built in another location. In Tomorrowland there once existed an air hockey version of the overhead electric car bumper rides found at one time in almost every county fair throughout America. This was Disneyland's flying saucer ride. This high-tech bumper car ride was introduced in 1961 and disappeared in 1965. The location where it was once located is approximately where Space Mountain sits today. Okay, so now we come to the real reason for this video. About eight months ago, I was brought several reels of 16mm film. Two of the films were very badly infected with what is called vinegar syndrome. This is a process of chemical degradation that affects cellulose acetate film made prior to 1980. It is called vinegar syndrome, or simply VS, due to the acetic acid that is released as the film degrades. Acetic acid is the same substance giving vinegar its distinct odor. Both films were warped very badly, but one was not only warped, but portions were so brittle that it could not be unspooled without crumbling in my hands. I have discovered, though, that many times, as you get closer to the core, the film is often in better condition. I decided to bank on that and put both films in a chemical bath of a product called Film Renew in hopes that this might help to rehydrate the film slightly, but more realistically, just work to halt the VS decay for a short time. If you're interested in learning more about this product, I'll put a link to it in the video's description box. I left the film in the bath for six months, and while not much could be done about the extremely brittle first part of the film, I was pleasantly surprised to find that the film was, indeed, a little more pliable and in better condition as I got closer to the core. After all of the soaking and digital editing, the final result turned out pretty good for the most part. If not for its historic nature, I doubt that I would have posted this, but the film was shot just months after Disneyland first opened in July of 1955. More importantly, it also contains footage of a man that was pivotal in the creation of both Disneyland and Magic Kingdom. 
With this film's content and an edge code that identifies it as 1956, I could do nothing else regardless of condition. Visitors at either of the U.S. Disney locations may be familiar with Fowler's Harbor at the Rivers of America in the California Park or the ferry boat Admiral Joe Fowler on the Seven Seas Lagoon at the Florida Park. Most, though, were not aware that retired Admiral Joe Fowler was a real person, and he had a great deal to do with the magic at Disneyland and Magic Kingdom. After hours of research and a lot of reading, it is my opinion that without the hard work and influence of Joe Fowler, these theme parks would have certainly been a little less magic. At this point, I would like to take a moment and explain what it is that was recorded in this black and white film from 1956. The first thing to note is that the footage is all about Admiral Joe Fowler and the Mark Twain Riverboat. Fowler appears several times in the film, and sometime in 1956 the dry dock area at Fowler's Harbor was drained and the Mark Twain was set high and dry in order to perform some maintenance on the boat. From what I could discern from the film, there were four primary objectives. Maintenance was performed on the engine, the gates to the lock were improved, I think by adding cement to the bottoms for additional weight and stability. And then the bottom of the boat was painted and new paint was applied above the waterline as well. All of this while Admiral Feller guided the boat into the dry dock and supervised the work like a proud father. As you watch the film, some of you will notice changes that have occurred over the years. I'd point out one really dramatic change that I noticed. Keep an eye out on the elevation of Fowler's Inn next to the water. Joe Fowler was born in 1894 and would hail from Lewiston, Maine. In 1917, at the age of 23, he graduated second in his class from Annapolis Naval Academy. He then began his long military career as a submarine navigator during World War I. In 1921, he would earn his master's degree in naval architecture at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. This would position the man to live a very interesting and productive life, both in the military and later as a civilian working to create Disneyland and the Magic Kingdom many years later. In the 1920s, that same master's degree would see him involved in the construction of gunboats in Shanghai, China, for use on the Yangtze River. It is said that around this time, while aboard a British gunship, he had the honor to bunk with Edward, Prince of Wales, who was a future King of England. Just after leaving China, while still in the 1920s, he would help design and build aircraft carriers such as the USS Lexington and USS Saratoga. Both ships served valiantly during World War II and are now part of our very proud American naval history. Eventually, he was relocated to his home state of Maine, where he would again work with submarines, but this time in a position of supervising their construction at the Portsmouth Naval Yard. Here you can see Joe Fowler on the second deck of the Mark Twain as he guided the boat into the dry dock that uh, Walt Disney had dubbed Joe's Ditch. Joe retired from the Navy in 1948, but in 1951 the Korean War would see him recalled to active duty. This time, though, his talents were used to help straighten out the military supply and acquisition lines. Fowler was one of those rare individuals that never seemed to fail at anything, and that got the attention of President Truman, who appointed him as a civilian director of the Federal Supply Management Agency. That's a mouthful. His job was to eliminate waste in the military, something I'm sure that they could really use right now. Here is another scene with Joe. With megaphone in hand, he walks back and forth across the deck, guiding the men, pulling on the ropes below, making sure that his baby makes it into dry talk safely. All of this experience made Rear Admiral Joe Fowler more than capable to perform any tasks set before him by his future boss, Walt Disney. During the 1954 construction of Disneyland, and the Mark Twain Riverboat in particular, Walt Disney began looking for someone familiar with naval architecture that could supervise the building of his 5 8 scale version of the Mississippi Riverboat. Sometime prior to 1954, a mutual friend introduced Walt and Joe and they became friends. At the time, Joe was building tract homes about 450 miles north of Anaheim in San Francisco, California, or in the area. So, in 1954, Joe began his second career that would span 25 years employed by Walt Disney. Along with supervising the construction of the Mark Twain Riverboat, Fowler was hired as the construction supervisor for the entire Disneyland project. 
Joe Fowler soon became known as the man that you could depend upon to find solutions for difficult situations and the ultimate problem solver. Walt Disney was a man that detested being told no or it's not possible when he asked if something could be done. It appears that these two men were meant to work together because Joe never said no. When Walt would change something or develop a new idea that would have to be incorporated into an existing plan, Joe Fowler would get it done. As a co-worker and a fellow Disney legend, Bob Matheson would share a story about an incident he personally witnessed. According to Matheson, Walt one day said that he wanted a waterfall on the Adventureland stage to open and close much like Moses parting the waters. This would allow the entertainers to mysteriously come out and then return after the show. Matheson related that Joe, without hesitation, just said, Can do, can do. That positive attitude, along with his practical experience and imagination, got him the nickname Can Do Joe. Joe Fowler was instrumental in the construction of many Disneyland projects, including the riverboat Mark Twain that is the focus of this film, but he did much more than this. After Disneyland's initial opening, Joe Fowler would serve as the park's general manager for the first 10 years, and he would go on to the massive project that turned an Orlando, Florida swamp into Disney World in the 1960s and 70s. At one time, wearing three different hats, Can Do Joe was Senior Vice President of Engineering and Construction for Walt Disney Productions, Chairman of the Board of Wet Enterprises, known currently as Walt Disney Imagineering, and Director of Construction for Disney's Buena Vista Construction Company. In 1990, Joe Fowler was inducted as a Disney legend and is the namesake of a dry dock at Disneyland's Rivers of America being named Fowler's Harbor and the Fowler's Inn at the same location. There is also a ferry that crosses the Seven Seas Lagoon named Admiral Joe Fowler at Disney World. I would also mention that there used to be two river boats, much like the Mark Twain attraction at Magic Kingdom. One boat, the Admiral Fowler, went into service on October 2nd of 1972, but was destroyed almost 10 years later when the boat fell from a crane onto the dry dock that she was being lowered onto. It was never replaced. The second was a river boat named after wet executive Richard F. Irvine. It was put into service in 1973, but later renamed Liberty Bell in 1996 after an extensive overhaul. One of the reasons why Walt Disney required a naval architect at the landlocked Disneyland was because he wanted to build watercrafts that were very large, and that they would carry many passengers, and he wanted to do that safely. In the case of the Mark Twain, and really all of the river boats in general, it had been 50 years since a steam-powered paddle wheeler had been constructed in the United States. Any really experienced steamboat builders by the 1950s would have been much too old to actually do the work. With this in mind, wed designers would conduct extensive research, giving them the knowledge that would allow them to build the 105-foot-long, 28-foot-tall boat with four decks. As a side note, most of us have no idea what WED stands for. I had to research it myself and found that it stands for Walter Elias Disney. WED Enterprises began while plans for Disneyland were still in the early design stages of development. It was for the purpose of creating an organization of people all working together on Disneyland, making collaboration much easier. Okay, back to the need for a naval architect. Someone with that experience was necessary for the Mark Twain construction, but that was only part of it. Well, in all fairness, this boat was the original reason, but then there was the Columbia, the Rivers of America, and let's not forget the rafts, the canoes, and the jungle ride tour boats. Then there was the movie 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, oh, I love that movie, that Joe Fowler worked on as a technical advisor. Moving on to the 1960s and 70s, there was a giant need for a naval architect in the Florida swamps that were being transformed into Disney's Magic Kingdom and all of the watercraft that might populate that park as well. Everyone that has graduated high school prior to the year 2000 has heard of Mark Twain. Beyond that, it gets a little bit sketchy. I'm not picking on anyone here, this is just my personal experience. I was involved in a conversation with some college freshmen from a local college last year. And not only did they not know who Mark Twain was, but none of them could name one author prior to 2012. Most thought Mark Twain was a YouTube personality. At that point, I just shook my head. So, for those of you that do know who the man was, maybe this will interest you. Besides being the name of a famous author that used to work as a riverboat sailor in real life, most folks are unaware that those two words, Mark Twain, actually mean something. 
During the day of the steam side wheeler and paddle wheeler river boats, the words Mark Twain meant that your boat was in deep enough water that it would not run aground. It meant that the water was two fathoms deep, or in landlubber speak, the water was twelve feet deep. The author Mark Twain, or Samuel Clemens, I should say, took his pen name from the message of safe haven for riverboat pilots of the day. For those familiar with Mark Twain but have forgotten, I would remind you that he was the author of many great books, including The Adventures of Tom Sawyer and The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. These were two of my favorite books as a young boy. I loved adventure and was always in trouble because of it. Both the Disneyland riverboat Mark Twain and the sailing ship Columbia Halls were built at the Todd Shipyards in San Pedro, California, and the decks were built at the Burbank Studios. Because the boats were so large, Joe Fowler wanted to incorporate a dry dock in the Rivers of America feature so that maintenance could more easily be performed when necessary. When Walt was made aware of the real estate that this dry dock would require, he was more than dismayed. He resented giving up that amount of space for something that would not be used that often. So when Walt referred to the dry dock, he called it Joe's Ditch, but later it was given the name of Fowler's Harbor. The rivers of America, much like Disneyland, were subject to failure now and then. When the day came to fill the river for the first time, it didn't go so well, as the water just soaked through the top layer of soil stabilizer that had been applied to the river bottom. Joe found a cache of clay within a reasonable distance and had it trucked in to replace the stabilizer, and when the river was filled once more, it stayed filled. When cost overruns and failures put the entire project over budget and corporate funds began to dry up, Walt used his own money to finish the project and the maiden voyage for the Mark Twain occurred on July 13, 1955. It was just four days before the park's grand opening that a private party consisting of 300 guests was held for Walt and Lillian Disney's 30th wedding anniversary. In preparation for the party, Joe Fowler was inspecting the boat when he discovered Lillian Disney sweeping the decks. I can only imagine the smile on his face as he joined her. It sounds like something my wife would do. I mentioned a number of failures that occurred in the early days of the Mark Twain and Disneyland in general. The star of the 1936 movie Showboat, Irene Dunn, had trouble when attempting to christen the boat by breaking a bottle of water across his bow. That bottle had been filled with water from many of America's major rivers. The passengers on what was the first paying trip of the Mark Twain were treated to a real fright, because at one point, most of the passengers moved to one side of the boat so they could catch a glimpse of the Indian encampment scene as it went by. This caused the boat to list to one side and making it possible for water to pour onto the lower deck. It had not occurred to anyone to determine the maximum number of guests that should be transported on each voyage. This became a real problem when a few days later the boat almost capsized when the operators allowed more than 500 guests aboard. After the boat came loose from its underwater track and got wedged in a muddy bank, it was established that 300 was the maximum passengers that could board the Mark Twain. And even today it is still set at 300 maximum. In the early years, the Disneyland band might be heard playing as the boat meandered along its course on the Rivers of America loop, and non-alcoholic mint juleps could be had for a fee. It's been 67 years now that the Mark Twain has been running the Rivers of America loop. In spring of 1995, she was given a major overhaul and sailed away with a new boiler and decks. Then in 2004, her hull was refurbished and she got a new keel. In 2005, for the park's 50th anniversary, the Mark Twain was given a brand new, more colorful paint job. Now that's not bad for a boat that has seen continuous service for 67 years, day in and day out. I wonder how many loops that was. I mentioned a number of failures that occurred in the early days of the Mark Twain and Disneyland in general. I've always been a romantic at heart, so when I discovered that there was a real wedding performed on the Mark Twain, it was a pleasant surprise. The first and only Disney Fantasyland wedding to be held on a Disney attraction took place September 24, 1995. The bride and groom, who were in themed attire, exchanged wedding vows as the Mark Twain ran the Rivers of America loop. The groom's father, wearing a Mark Twain costume for the occasion, was a fellow named Ed Sullivan, a 50-year Disney veteran. Ah, I know what you're thinking. No, it wasn't the TV Ed Sullivan. Sorry. This once-in-a-lifetime ceremony was embellished with a young couple, Kevin and Patricia Sullivan, pulling the steamboat's whistle together, sealing their vows, and releasing a banner proclaimed just married across the stern. 
While researching this video, I discovered a web page from 2018 displaying a photograph of a flyer that advertised a Mark Twain riverboat wedding. The cost, according to the flyer, was a minimum of $40,000. I could not find anything to support this, so I'm going to chalk it up to someone's Disney fantasy. Joe Fowler retired from Disney in 1978, but still worked as a consultant on some projects. This would be his second full retirement, with the first being the military. It was 1990 when he was acknowledged as one of the elite men and women who had been inducted as a Disney legend. He lived out his final years in Orlando, Florida and passed away in 1993 at the age of 99. Men, like Rear Admiral Joe Fowler, were a very rare commodity in the last century. I truly wonder if this century is capable of producing anyone like him. This man had an extraordinary life and career. I have only touched on a few of the highlights. To learn more, just Google his name. You won't be sorry. Well, I hope you enjoyed this vintage glimpse into the early days of Disneyland, Admiral Fowler, and some of the gentlemen that worked to maintain the park in 1956. If you did, I would ask that you please pass this film along to others so that they may see it as well. And if you could spare a ducat in the bucket, or a dollar or two lying around, I would really appreciate a cup of coffee. The link is below and on this channel's homepage. Thank you so much for watching, and make sure that you hit the like and subscribe button so that you don't miss the next rare film offering coming soon. God bless and take care.